Hello. This is the third lecture among several this semester that will introduce some of the ideas you've been reading about and viewing. It's been a pleasure reading your discussions uh, and your, your film reflections over the past couple weeks. Make sure you keep up with them and uh, keep up with the quizzes as well, which are the really the assignments that actually uh, really close and when they're closed you can't do them over again. So the quizzes are um, make sure that you fit into the timeline for those. Um, so this is the third lecture, and this lecture will focus on musicals that interrogated or revealed riffs in the mainstream culture. We'll start with Hair, and then go way back to revisit Race in Showboat from the 1920s. So I left you last time with some considerations for Oklahoma, which is usually considered a nationalistic patriotic piece. I ask you not to just look at the romance, the space, the vision, the melodrama of good guy and bad guy. What is the subtext? What is underneath? What is the social structure? Why is Judd considered so bad? How is gender treated? Ethnicity and race? What about justice? Look beyond the surface and think about how these things play out in the film. For example, what truths about American justice are revealed in the comic trial scene at the end of the movie? What does it suggest about what is right and wrong and how it is determined? Is it fair? What is it based on? Do you agree with what happens? In the late 1950s and into the 1960s, a significant counterculture began to develop. A large part of this counterculture was music. With blues and jazz at its roots, rock and roll developed into a mainstream popular music form in the late 1950s, and by the mid-1960s was a cultural power. This new genre of music took over popular music almost entirely, pushing musical theater songs, which were previously the most popular kind of music, off the popular charts for good by the late 1960s. This is a significant shift, as it meant that the music that was typically used in musicals was no longer the most popular or recognizable music in the culture. You might remember a grandparent or great-grandparent singing show tunes. My grandmother, who was born in 1916, had a show tune for every occasion. They weren't necessarily musical fans, but that was the music that was played on the radio. Irving Berlin, Cole Porter, the Gershwins, and musicals that sounded like that. With the baby boomers those born directly after World War II, these show tunes became less of their cultural heritage, and rock and roll, with the Beatles at the forefront and the peak, entering the U.S. market in 1963, 50 years ago. This is combined, however, with the growth and development of amateur theatrical groups, which expanded tremendously after World War II, at the same time that the American musical business was booming with hit Broadway shows and hit movies coming out all the time. The resonance of the brilliant success of musicals from the 1940s and 1950s continues to last today. Scholar Stacy Wolf is currently completing a book on amateur productions of musical, the American musical after Broadway, dinner theaters, road shows, and amateur hours, which I hope to be able to use in this course the next time I teach it. As the community and educational context of many musical theater productions is an important part of their continued legacy. I'm sure many of you grew up participating or attending local community-based groups, not at your school necessarily, but maybe at a local church or some other community center, and this might have been one of your first access points to being in or seeing, or both, uh, musical theater. Hair was the first mainstream musical that brought rock and roll into the center of the musical experience. While Viet Rock, a couple years earlier, was the first rock musical, the success and breadth of Hair has made it the one that everyone remembers and still experiences today. The film, which wasn't made till ten years after the original theatrical production, helped propagate that success, even though, as you'll find, it's significantly different than the original musical. It's much more narrative and focused, a result of the needs of that particular film. Track some of those changes in your journal for this week. What is new and interesting about Hair? Its process is relatively new, as it was developed in the relatively new non-profit arena, at the public theater, and then quickly transferred to a commercial Broadway production. As with Cradle Will Rock in the 1930s, the relative poverty of the non-profit world gave Hair a lot more room to experiment than if it had been developed directly for the commercial theater. The public and other nonprofits continue to use this model. Hamilton, for example, which was also developed at the public and then moved to Broadway last year to obvious great success.
Ironically, the revival of Hair that had a success Broadway run several years ago was also developed at the Public Summer Theater in Central Park before being revived for a, a Broadway run. The Public and its producer Joe Papp did the same thing several years after Hair with a highly successful A Chorus Line. What else is noteworthy about Hair? What do you think of the music? The message? Is it politically activist? Is it effective as a political tool? Was it at the time? Does it maintain any political efficacy now? Showboat is an interesting case, and we waited to cover it here to use it as a way to discuss, discuss the complexity of the American music form, even from its beginning. A story tied up with race, history, gender, and musical styles, Showboat was Oscar Hammerstein's first foray into the story musical, and sets up many of the things to come. But I hope we see in it, as well, the levels of complexity that the greatest American musicals have brought up. Why does the musical do this so much more effectively than so many other forms, including straight plays? What about Showboat is revolutionary? What about it is propagating the status quo? As you think about Showboat, you should think that you should remember that it came out about the same time as the jazz singer. So they are contemporary in terms of coming out in the late 1920s, before the Great Depression. What do those two pieces have to say or show or express about race, about American culture, uh, about the role of minorities, right? Uh, either African Americans or, or uh, Jews in that partic those particular times and places. These are questions we'll continue to ponder as we enter the last two weeks of the class already. Make sure you hand in your midterm uh, via the Moodle website by July 26th and have it sent in and have sent in a subject for your final by July 25th. Your bibliography for your final is due August 1st, giving you then about a week to actually write it. Again, let me know if you have any questions. Send me emails if you really want to get in touch with me. That's the best way. And keep up the good work. Have a good week.